Let's talk fourth wing. One of the things that Rebecca Yaros does so well is her representation of diversity and disability. So to bring more light to the character Violet Sorengale and for us, the readers of Fourth Wing, to learn more about Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome in general, I had the great privilege to interview neurodivergent mommy blogger Elspeth, who is so educated and knowledgeable and has Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome just like Violet Sorengale. She was very open, sharing things from her real life that she really goes through on a daily basis. I learned a lot, and I hope that you also find this enjoyable and educational. I will put the link to her Facebook blog in the description so you can go support her and what she does for the community, and I hope you enjoy. So I found you through your Facebook blog on neurodivergent parenting. Yep. Would you please talk a little bit about what inspired you to start that group and the mm. impact that you feel like you're having on your community? Well, when my eldest child was diagnosed autistic and ADHD, um, I started looking for ways to understand him. But I soon realized that I already really intuitively understood my child extremely well. And so a little further investigation led me to the fact that I too am autistic and ADHD. And so we went on to test my youngest and so was she. And so I still thought, well, you know, I, I have a degree in anthropology and I have a degree in child development. At that point, I had about 15 years of professional early childhood development experience. And I thought, okay, I, I have a pretty good amount of information under my belt, but I, I should be able to find resources to help me, you know, parent my kids effectively and compassionately. So I started looking and there really wasn't the things out there that I thought there would be because a lot of what I found was what they called autism mom pages, uh -huh. which were pages from neurotypical parents that were kind of grieving the fact that their kids were autistic or in other ways neurodivergent. And they were having to come to terms with the fact that their child had a different way of processing their their understanding of the world and a different way of communicating. It was like kind of like dealing with people that are having to learn a foreign language. And really what I needed was somebody that already spoke that language and could dialogue with me. So I realized that I was going to have to create my own page for autistic and ADHD, dyslexic and dyspraxic parents like myself. So I really wanted to be there for, for other people in my community that are parenting from that neurodivergent place. I have found your page to be extremely helpful as a parent who, <laughs> neurodivergent here, having the children, just the tips you give, the encouragement, the non-judgment, it has been so helpful. And then the fact that you're so open and generous with your information and speaking mm -hmm. up about the fact that you are also Ehlers-Danlos, Am I saying mm -hmm. that right? Yep, Ehlers Downlos. And um, Ehlers? some people okay. just call it heads, which sounds weird, but it's um okay. there's there's about 19 different types of Ehlers Downlos. So the type that I have and that is very common among neurodivergent people is hypermobility, uh -huh. Ehlers Downlos syndrome, which is abbreviated as H dash you know, EDS. So that's, it's heads, which could sound kind of odd. When I was explaining to my kids, I had heads. They're like, no, one. <laughs> well, you've already taught me something. The point that I want for this collaboration and this video, because this is about a fantasy book, a fantasy world, a character who's not a real person, but it can be really easy to see what she has as a weird fantasy thing. Yes. It's a real yeah. life thing that real people have. And I'm so excited to learn and have you teach us more. Well, let me get to the questions that I sent you so you can be more prepared. Violet Sorengale, before going to Basquiat War College, she was in training to be a scribe. And this is not a question I would have even thought to ask you if I didn't follow your Facebook blog because you mm -hmm. said something about it one time. So mm -hmm. for people who aren't familiar with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, what would be the problem with a job where you're writing all day if you didn't have modern technology to help? Handwriting is one of the hardest things I do in my life because it doesn't just involve your finger and hand and arm muscles. You really can't effectively handwrite if you have or muscles that are not particularly strong. Mm. And with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, um, we have weaker connective tissues. So we don't have as much collagen holding our tendons and ligaments strong to bind our muscles and bones together. We don't have those core muscles and we don't have the ligaments and tendons supporting our bones. And so that makes it very hard for us to use those fine motor 
muscles. So handwriting becomes incredibly difficult. It's not uncommon for people with heads to get diagnosed also with dyspraxia, which is a, uh, a muscle coordination disorder. That means that when I do write, I just have so much weakness in my arm that my hand will spasm and I, I throw pens and pencils. So writing really, really is difficult. And um, one thing that might interest anybody else raising a neurodivergent family is that with one of my children who has both heads and dyspraxia. I've spent years struggling teaching him to write, no matter what we did, physical therapy, occupational therapy, <laughs> support services. We were not getting there. The thing that has made a difference in me being able to teach him how to write has been learning to ride a bike. He didn't have bilateral coordination skills, which means doing something on one side of your body and doing something different on the other. I had to get him developmentally to a place where he could coordinate different sides of his body. Then we had to build up the muscles to bike ride. Then we had to put those together. After a few months of bike riding, he had built up enough core muscles that he could then better control his arms. And that's when we could get handwriting. That is so illuminating. Oh. And I really want to rabbit trail here, but I won't. So in the book, Violet, when she thought she was going to be a scribe, was really looking forward to these magic pens that they had where she wouldn't have to hold it, she could control it with her mind and it would do the writing. Do you find yourself preferring to type, use speech to text? What is your go-to? Yeah. So I don't mind typing. Typing I'm okay with. Um, my kids would prefer speech to text. I grew up old school. I'm, I'm, I was born in 81. So we, in high school, you had to take typing lessons. You, you know, I actually grew up using a typewriter. We had a Commodore 64. You know, I grew up with that skill. So remembering the technology is available to me. Like my kids are always grabbing my phone and going, you could just ask Google with the microphone or you could ask Alexa, just say it. And it doesn't occur to me. I, I'm a creature of habit and I just, yeah. I'd rather type. People with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, as we get older, we do lose a lot of that flexibility because what happens is, we do not realize how much we've been overusing our joints and how much we've been pushing them past normal range of flexibility and normal capacity. And so over time, it does do damage that we don't necessarily feel or if we do feel, if we're like perhaps like me, autistic, we don't have good interoception which is that sensation of feelings inside the body. I have trouble telling when I'm sick, when I'm tired or hungry. So if we don't have that good introception, we don't realize that the discomfort we're feeling is from an injury we may have sustained. And we tend to develop a lot of arthritis <laughs> and we tend to get more and more immobile. And so we kind of pay for that hyperflexibility by becoming less and less flexible as we get older. Uh, thank you for sharing so much. I love to learn. So I'm really appreciating this. This one could get more personal for you. So only open up as much as you're willing. Um, the hopeful dragon riders have to rely on their strength. Usually the large, well-muscled people, they're college age, like young 20s. They're the ones who go to the war college to learn how to ride a dragon. Violet, besides the Ehlers-Danlos, is also just small. She doesn't have the physical strength to rely on. She has to rely on her intelligence her wit, mm -hmm. and her other attributes. She's very fast. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you, what is something you feel like you are very good at? And do you feel pressured to have to be better at it to make up for perceived weaknesses? I definitely, as a child, uh, one thing that came with Ehlers-Danlos and having that weak core musculature is that I could accomplish things, but I had no stamina. So I was a really good sprinter, but don't ask me to run a, you know, an eight minute mile kind of thing I like that. <laughs> um, yes, I, I could do things. I could do things fast and quickly and easily. And then people just are like, oh, if you're capable of that, you can keep doing it. So show me again and then teach them and then practice. It's like, well, no, I did it once. I'm done. <laughs> I had a lot of adults in my life, particularly because I was not diagnosed until I was an adult, thinking that they could just kind of, I, I, it was willpower. It was a matter of willpower. They could bolster me up and I could realize I could accomplish great things and I could move forward and I could do it. And I couldn't. I was doing as much as I possibly could already. And particularly because I'm autistic as well, I was being very honest about that fact. And I would tell people, I, like, I'm being honest. Why would you not believe me? And to them, it's like, oh, well, you're you're just telling me how uncomfortable you are. It's like, no, I'm, I'm telling you I've hit my limit. I kind of became the program manager. They would make me the team leader knowing that didn't mean I was going to be the star performer or the quarterback or the head, but I was going to be like 
the person that could direct that person to do a good job, you know? Well, okay. So I feel like you have then had the practice of what you're doing now. Yeah. Starting way back at that <laughs> age, you've taken all that knowledge to help other people. You've helped me and my family and you don't even know it. The fact that you embraced what you're good at and keep doing it, even with children and through all your struggles, I appreciate that. Thank you. I try. Let's talk accommodations. Okay. <laughs> uh, for some people who might not know what accommodations are, for two people who need to accomplish the same thing, if there's a barrier, if it's harder for one person, they can get, should be able to get some mm -hmm. kind of accommodation to even the playing field and help them to accomplish the thing or mm -hmm. maybe lessen the barrier, help them over that barrier. Would you add anything to what an accommodation is before I ask the question? There's a popular meme on the internet, or maybe it's only popular among certain circles, that um, shows some kids trying to watch a baseball game being played over a fence. And they're on the boxes? And yeah, they're on boxes. So there's, there's, there's the kids all standing side by side, and one kid's much taller than the others. And it says, you know, this is, this is life. And then equality is we've given the kid that's shorter some boxes to boost him up, you know, so that he can see too, but he's still a little shorter. And then equity is, you know... It could be that we've now given them enough boxes that they're the same level. But honestly, what it probably is, is we've removed the fence. Mm. <laughs> Everybody can now access it. Whether or not they need boxes is irrelevant. They now have access. So I like to think of as a, you know, a true accommodation what is something that removes that barrier. Thank you. I like your answer better because you're telling us what the accommodation should be. And yeah. that's not always what it is. So <laughs> for Violet, she has to ride a dragon. She is mm -hmm. a smaller size than most other dragon riders. She has a bigger dragon than everyone else, and she can't mm -hmm. stay on. She's constantly falling off. Her accommodation is a saddle that her wing leader mm -hmm. made for her. She hates it. She hates that she needs it. She feels mm -hmm. like it is a strong visual representation that she's not just different, but also lesser. That's how she's seeing herself okay. needing it. You kind of said, what would you like people to know about accommodations? Yeah. What would you like the people who need the accommodations to know? Or maybe the people who see someone else using an accommodation? What would yeah. you say? I'm going to give you an example. When I had my son in public school, which we've, we've ended up withdrawing to homeschool because that's the accommodation he really needed. No matter what we did, Yay. he wasn't happy where he was. <laughs> yeah. One of, one of the things we went through was, and with my daughter, was sound sensitivity. And in my son's school in particular, um, it was designed uh, by engineers that really had no experience with kids. They had built it so that the uh, ceilings were kind of like steel and exposed so that you could trace all the HVAC systems and the wires and the oh. internet and the pipes through the school and see how everything connected. But then they had tile floors and then they chose glass uh, walls. It was extremely loud. And I wanted my kids to have the ability to wear noise dampening headphones. First thing the principal told me is we can't do that. And I said, why can't we do that? They said, because that will make them stand out and they'll get bullied. It's not that they can't, it won't work. It's not that it's not available. It's not that it won't make things better for them. It's that you would have to work harder to make sure other people were not abusing them. I would just say that using accommodations takes a lot of courage. <laughs> it's It just takes so much courage to uh, to use those accommodations. And the, the most people, you know, it would be nice for me if people would not only be tolerant of you using those accommodations, those canes, those scooters, those headphones, those braces, but I would like to see people complimenting it. Like, you know, it's so good that you're, you're using that. I, I wish I had used that last time I hurt my leg. You know, I wish I wish I had thought to bring headphones to the baseball game. You needed that. Good for looking out for yourself. Look, you're able to parent while you're using that cane and that wheelchair. You know, that, that frees you up to be more present with them. I'm proud of you. You know, I'd like to see that. I would too. I think the world is changing, building awareness, building acceptance, but it's slow. So one thing I also wanted to elaborate on is if she doesn't like the special saddle, other things that could be done potentially to accommodate her, but because of that core musculature that we often struggle to build up and that is important in order to do those other things, she could be wearing a back brace under her clothes or under a vest or cloak or whatever. She could also be wearing arm or wrist braces that could easily be disguised as some sort of gauntlet. Okay. Um, you know, she, she could be get, being given strength training exercises. And there are even some devices which are um, these kind of bands that go back and forth across the body that crisscross at certain joints to kind of double them up. And quite honestly, if you wear them in public, people don't know what they are. <laughs> 
it just tends to look like an unusual fashion. You know, it tends to look a little kinky, but you can pass it off as fashion. It is interesting that you bring that up. The author is knowledgeable. She has the syndrome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But little things like that, that I would not notice, but you have brought it up. She has a tight vest that she wears super duper laced up. It's made, I think, from dragon scales. So it's very tight and supportive. She wears it under her clothes so no one sees Mm -hmm. it. So that was really cool that you brought that up. And then one of my questions was about strength training. So we'll just skip to that one. One of the things that her wing leader also does for her is gets one of the stronger students to get her to start doing strength training. Uh, He tells her that building her muscle will help take some of the pressure off her joints. Yeah, that is true. The thing about some of these tendons and ligaments is some of them cannot be rebuilt. Tendons can often, I believe, regenerate. Ligaments cannot. Once it's gone, you got to go in and get that sucker sewn back up. (laughs) They're kind of like rubber bands have been pulled too hard and snapped. If you can build up the muscles, you're taking some of that strain off the tendons and ligaments. Muscles are more like your your body's brake system. If you've got really good brakes, then perhaps your seatbelts don't need to be as tight because you can stop before the accident happens. I think that's very illuminating for readers of the book because that's something Mm -hmm. that's thrown in there that if it's not well-researched and it's false... You don't want that in your book. This author is very good. She's done a lot of things really well. So this one, I'm asking you some personal questions and I appreciate your openness. This is a romance novel Mm -hmm. and Violet has two men who are kind of into her. They both care about her and they both Mm -hmm. want her to be safe and to succeed Mm -hmm. in life. Dane is her old friend and her squad leader. And he's known her since she was a kid. He's seen her Mm -hmm. get injured. He's seen Mm -hmm. how long it takes her to heal. And Mm -hmm. so... His way of protecting her and watching out for her is to Mm -hmm. emphasize her fragility, her physical Mm -hmm. weakness. He wants to treat her like she'll break at any moment. Mm -hmm. And then Zayden, who has just met her, he's her wing leader, a higher rank than Dane. He's the Mm -hmm. one who made her the saddle. He makes her some special daggers. He gets her the strength Mm -hmm. training. He wants to train her and equip her to do the job she is trying to do by emphasizing her strengths and building her strengths. So in your experience, do you feel like the people in your life who really care about you, do they tend to take Dane's root of here's what you're weak at or Zayden's root of here's what you're strong at? And which one do you prefer? Well, I definitely get both ends of that. And it's interesting where it comes into my life. One thing about growing up in a neurodiverse family is that there are a lot of things that can co-occur with neurodivergence. We sometimes hear comorbid, which sounds so much worse. You think about hearing like, well, if you've got lung cancer, you might also get breast cancer, liver cancer. You hear about all these like horrible things that could happen. I don't like to think of it as morbid. I just like to think of it as co-occurring. Certain things go together and it makes sense because when you're born with a neurodivergent brain, if you think about neurodivergent brains as having this command center where everything's going to operate differently, it tells our bodies to operate differently. If you're autistic, you're more likely to be ADHD. If you're ADHD, you're more likely to be dyslexic. If you're any of those, you're more likely to have hypermobility, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. You're more likely to have anxiety. Because G, always being put in an environment that doesn't socially fit you or doesn't physically adapt to you is going to cause anxiety. And guess what? If you don't get those needs met, that might make you depressed. And G, if you're depressed and anxious and don't quite fit in and are socially awkward and kind of isolated, that might lead to mental illness. So you kind of get these this like spiral where if your needs aren't being met, it can become a big problem. Now, in my family, being from a neurodivergent family, we've got a lot of those co-occurring conditions. And in my case, I am one of the more able-bodied people. My father ended up with a spinal cord injury, possibly because of his, some of his hypermobility. My mother ended up with some pretty severe arthritis and joint replacements. And that means that, shockingly, I am more capable and always was growing up more capable physically than my parents, which means that they had to support me as being capable in ways that other parents might not have because there were things they couldn't do. And that gave me a lot of agency. And that gave me a lot of mental strength and emotional strength being like, okay, I'm capable of doing this. On the other hand, that makes it hard for me to go, I can, but maybe there's other people that could help me or do it with me or do it for me. I'm less likely to reach out because in my family, I'm thought of as being the most capable person. It can be hard for me to realize that I need to reach out. So I can understand both perspectives. I can understand somebody going like, look, I know you can do this, but you really shouldn't have to do this and I want to help you. And sometimes we need to hear that. But on the other hand, especially 
especially when somebody's young and they're still at that physical fitness peak, that's the time to build up that sense of agency. And building up that sense of agency is so important to warding off the anxiety and the depression and the social isolation. So I would definitely go for the guy that does that, that builds up her agency. Well, she does too. In the long totally. run, it's not just about protecting your body, it's about protecting your mind. Love that you said it that way, because I think a lot of times we separate the two. The body is yeah. this thing and the mind is this thing, but they affect each other a lot. And here's the adult questions. First, does your scalp ever tingle? Yeah, like the, the ASMR, I definitely have that reaction. To, okay, but, do you have yeah. that reaction if you feel like someone attractive is looking at you? No, but I'm also autistic, so I, I have issues with being perceived. I have perception okay. phobia. The but, scalp tingling was like a humorous thing that people who read the book were like, that's not a real thing. No, I definitely have ASMR for, you know, I definitely get the scalp tingling reaction to pleasant sensory things, but okay. having people stare at me or give me too much attention is not one of them. Violet brags to one of the love interests that she's super bendy. It never comes up in the bedroom scenes. And if you're... Oh, it should. <laughs> okay, you're answering already. Uh, is extreme flexibility a boon or something to be worried about in that situation? I think both. It can be a lot of fun. <laughs> so I remember being about 19 or 20 years old and being in a relationship and we tried something a little experimental and my leg went out, me completely out. I did not want to call my parents to drive an hour to my same sex hookup to get me to a hospital for a sex injury. <laughs> I did not feel comfortable. And I just didn't know what to do. So I had to call my older brother. You're going to have to show up and put my leg back in. And in the position I'm in, I also can't get clothes on. So just try to look as, as little as possible. That was that was not one of my most fun moments. My brother didn't talk to me for about a six months out of trauma. Thank you for so, being so open. I love that. So, that's, that's real life. You develop a high pain tolerance too. So you're like, look, I'm not panicking. I'm just humiliated at this point. That's a good point, too, because yeah. she's in a college where they fight a lot. So she gets hurt. Yeah. She has already kind of developed that high pain tolerance yeah. before the book even starts. And then the, I don't know if you kind of answered that already. The next, the, my last adult question is in consensual encounters, and I want to emphasize consensual, um, is there still the fear of getting hurt? Do you feel like trust in yeah. the book is even more important for you? I think it's more important for any but any kind of disability, honestly. You know, we talk a lot more these days about feminism needing to be intersectional, you know, needing to value the contributions of Black, Brown, Indigenous women, needing to recognize it, the importance of people's economic status in achieving women's liberation. If women are earning less than the dollar, are taking time off for maternity leave, if they're the ones staying at home with the kids, they don't have that buying power in the economy. They don't have the ability maybe to unionize their jobs if they're working in small businesses and child care. We need to talk about intersectionality. And with disability, that intersectionality is also really, really important. And so talking about how disability interacts with sexuality, how much consent is important to disability. We can't just talk about heads, you know, hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. We need to talk about all disabilities because a lot of disabilities affect communication. And like I said, HEADS is more common among people with ADHD, people with autism, and those are both conditions which do affect your ability to communicate. So it's not just about your body and the sublaxations and the dislocations. The consent has to be almost enthusiastic consent. We talk about that more now too, right? It's not enough that you kiss her and she doesn't resist. You need to be kissing her and she needs to be kissing you back and enjoying herself and moaning and grabbing you. We need that enthusiastic consent in the disability community because so many of us do struggle to express ourselves with words. You have to be looking for behaviors that indicate consent. That is a wonderful answer. I might move that up higher in the interview. <laughs> <laughs> when you're reading this book, it gets very descriptive in those bedroom mm -hmm. scenes. And so that idea of enthusiastic consent is super important. Mm -hmm. So thank yeah. you. So Fourth Wing has really good representation. That's one of the things I think Yaros did really well. So not just disability, although there's more than one type of disability, um, gender identity, skin color, and it's all just well done. Those aren't the only attributes that the character has. They're a real character first. How important do you feel like it is for fiction nowadays to have that representation. It's huge. It's huge. You know, growing up, fantasy was my thing too. I was very into fantasy. 
Um, and my first contact with any sort of queer character was the Mercedes Lackey's Magic Pawns, Magic Promise, Magic Price books, where they had a Herald of Valdemar who was gay. And it just, it shook my world and it opened me up to new things. And I started not only reading more fiction with queer characters and seeking it out, but I started going and doing research on gender roles and sociology and sexuality and Masters and Johnson and, you know, you know how, how we conceptualize gender in the West as a binary. And it just, it just opened up, you know, it opened me up to so many things. I think that is so important. I personally never encountered a character in a fiction book with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And I think that that's amazing because I know with my kids growing up, the only person they have to talk about it really with is me. Mm -hmm. You know, my parents have disabilities that are more complex. So my dad most likely has it, but it's it's on the bottom of his bucket list of things to worry about when you've got a spinal cord injury and a traumatic brain injury. So it doesn't get discussed. It's really just me. It's mom's weird thing that we all know about. And now it's their weird thing that they know about. Mm -hmm. Having other people that they can connect to in the world, even if they're fictional, it's humanizing. <laughs> you Thank know? you. And I think a lot of the people who want to spend their time reading books and reading fiction are the people who are, who at least feel different from everybody else. And then they can find characters yeah. like them and feel mm -hmm. less alone. Is there anything else that you would like people to know about Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome? Maybe something you think is the most misunderstood thing or just... Any last words? <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I'd like to give a short plug to my my uh, Facebook blog, which can be found on Facebook at Neurodivergent Parenting and a colon, those two little dots, one on top of the other, think outside the box. So neurodivergent parenting, think outside the box. And on my page, I do talk about autism, OCD, ADHD, but I also talk about things like Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and anxiety and dyspraxia and ARFID, Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder, and other conditions that maybe once you read about them, you'll go, oh, this is what's been going on in my family. Because the thing is, is things like Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, it's not that they're rare. It's that they are rarely diagnosed. Doctors aren't looking for them. This is why we're suddenly seeing a spike in autism statistics. Suddenly everybody's autistic and all the schools are having to hire more special education teachers because everybody's autistic now. You know what? They've always been there. <laughs> but doctors are finally paying attention and know what to look for. People with heads are out there. They just haven't been getting the support or even the acknowledgement. And believe me, you start to go insane when you're having all these symptoms and nobody acknowledges that they even exist. It drives you bonkers. We need that acknowledgement to stay human, to stay well mentally, to stay connected with society and with medical care. I absolutely agree. And I think you are doing your part with your Facebook blog. I encourage people to go find it. I will link it in the description of the video. Um, and again, thank you so much, Elspeth, for taking the time, for being so open and for sharing. I'm happy to help. Thank you so much. I'm going to have to go out and read those books. They sound really exciting. Do it. <laughs>